right, so this is the seventh lecture on early childhood. And here I want to talk about uh, gender and gender identity and gender identity formation. So first of all, I need to make very clear or I need to make sure we understand. And, and this is actually like a whole sub area and there's a whole chapter in the sociology chapter and you can actually make a whole career out of studying gender is what gender is. Gender and sex are not the same thing. Uh, these are routinely confused. G sex refers to one's anatomy. It refers to one's body. It refers to one's genetics. It refers to your estrogen, your progesterone, your, uh, your vaginas, and your penises, right? Gender is social. Gender is your way of being. It's how you are in the world. It's how you dress. It's how you express yourself. It's the jobs you like. It's the way you wear your hair. Um, it is, and gender is thought, if we were in the sociology class, we would talk about how gender is thought to be completely social. That we are, we learn um, and we are socialized to think of ourselves as male or female. And then from there, we figure out, we learn, um, yeah, we figure out and we learn how we're supposed to be in the world, how we're supposed to act, how we're supposed to dress, what kinds of things we're supposed to like to do, um, what roles we're supposed to play in society. Uh, yeah, so, gen uh, yes, gen but sex is, much more straightforward in that sex refers to our bio, our biology. Psychology takes a little bit, uh, no, not a little bit. Psychology takes a position that is more focused on the biology side of, of gender construction. So it are, has some theories that argue that the reason men and women and boys and girls are so quote unquote different from each other is because there are there is some biological component that some biological component that influences how we interact in the world right when we talk about gender identity much like when we were talking about um, the self coming to understand who we are uh, gender identity is the process of how a child understands that they that they are a boy or they are a girl, and then what that means, right? What it means to be a boy or a girl, and how do how do how come or how does a three year old learn that where girls wear dresses, right, and boys and and boys play with cars, right, and then how do they come to know that they are a little boy and that is a little that person over there is a little boy too and because they're little boys we play with trucks right because this really isn't something I mean, if you think about it if, if you if you think about it it's not really something that parents sit down and say well you're a little boy and she's a little girl and you have a penis and they have a vagina it's just it it doesn't really happen that way it, a parent may say you're a girl and girls do this but what does that mean Right? What does that mean? And that's what some of these theories here are about, right? So sex and gender. Gender is um, how you think of yourself as a girl or how you think of yourself as a boy, right? And then gender identity, again, is your, your awareness of that. Like, how did I come to know that? I mean, certainly some families tell them, tell children that, but, a lot, but, but you almost don't have to, right? And sometimes, um, you, you, you don't have to tell your children that, that they're a boy or they're a girl. Norms refer to the behaviors, that what's expected, right? So gender norms are that, that boys wear pants and girl, or girls can wear skirts and boys have to wear pants, or that girls play with dolls and boys play with, play with trucks, or that moms uh, moms cook and dads clean. That's all, that's what, the, those, that's what the, the, that means. Roles refer to, they refer to like a collection of norms. So gender roles are boys or dads and girls or moms. And girls, you know, and girls are moms and moms, you know, do the dishes. And boys are dads and dads do the yard work, right? And so what is the, the role? I always like to tell a, a story that I'm quite proud of. Um, in my family, it was sort of reversed. My husband did when my kids were small. He, well, he still does. He still does most of the cooking. Um, <clears throat> and my daughter would have been about eight or so. And we were on a vacation with my in-laws, my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law. And in their family, mom, Aunt Bonnie, did the cooking. And my daughter says, 
mom, does Aunt Bonnie cook? And I said, you know, yeah, Aunt Bonnie cooks. And she says, hmm, I thought only boys cooked. Right, of course, I was very proud of that because what it said to me is that I had, we had raised her, she had a different gender role, right? In her mind, boys were the, were the ones that cooked, not girls. Gender typing is a way, uh, is a way culture assigns certain occupations or certain colors or certain sports or certain toys to girls. So when we gender type something, we basically say that that thing, that behavior, that, that way of being is assigned to girls or boys. So a gender type might be, oh, I'm kind of at a loss. I'm trying to think about preschool kids here, but a gender type might be that uh, boys play with the trucks and girls play in the kitchen, right? Or boys play um, in the treehouse and girls play in the, you know, in the dollhouse or something like that. Gender stereotypes, this is, this is, so it's, it's also important to say because sometimes people think that when you're pointing out these differences, you're implying that they're bad. And that's not the implication, the implication is not that they're bad. The implication is, is that more often than not, things that are assigned female are considered less valuable or less important or given less credit or they're paid less than men when we assign things. So we've seen, we actually see this with children that boys will play, no, no, girls will play with boy dolls, with boy toys. Girls will play with boy toys, but boys won't play with girl toys. And that suggests, or at least some scholars have asked, is that because girl things are stigmatized? Like, why is it that girls are more interested? You know, another great one is like the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts thing, right? Why, why did more girls join the Boy Scouts than boys join the Girl Scouts, right? Where is it because there's something, there's, it's seen as more, or another example is when a girl acts like a boy, she's a tom girl, she's a tomboy, but there's not a parallel. And when a girl acts, I'm sorry, when a boy acts like a girl, there's not a teen a girl, we call him a sissy, right? So what is it about the feminine compared to the masculine that implies that masculine is better than feminine? And gender stereotypes are when we have restricted people based on a perception of their gender because here's the thing most people we don't really see their body parts we don't really know what the reproductive or organs are we we just draw conclusions about the reproductive organs based on what kind of clothing they're wear, they're wearing right so <clears throat> when we overgeneralize and we say well you're a boy and you can only do that or we assume that because you're a boy you only do that what happens then when you're a boy and you don't do that or you don't want to do that, or you're not interested. And we then restrict people's expression, their expression to the gender in which we have assigned them. And that's really when, when we start getting by stereotypes, that's, that's the danger, that's the risk, is when people's ability to be a full person or their, or their ability to, be, to reach their fully actualized self is limited or restricted by some social rules about how they're supposed to be based on their gender. Right? That's the danger of gender. But the fact that the fact that our population is defined, that the human species is divided, that's not the issue. That's not the issue. The issue is that one way of being is has more value than the other way of being, and that we're forced, right? That these boxes are pretty rigid. And there are pretty profound consequences, especially for the boys, for getting out of their box. So the rest of, you'll see in this slide, it looks like it's number four. No, 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 it's not number 14, it is number 12, are some of the theories about gender identity and gender identity formation. How does it happen, right? How, how, does, how do children come to grasp this so quickly, so quickly? Well, we've already kind of talked about some of them, but so the, the biological explanation is, suggests that boys and girls are fundamentally different because our brains are different. And it points to things like, like the corpus callosum, which is the tissue that connects the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere, is actually thicker in girls than it is in boys. 
Um, and it, it, so, so some uh, brain scholars, you know, argue that that's the reason that women are, women are better multitasking is because their right hemisphere and their left hemisphere are more connected and men are better able to focus, right? Or they're more narrow minded or they're more narrowly focused on things because their corpus callosum, and their, their brains are not as connected. There's something called androgens. And the androgen is a, oh shoot, I don't exactly know what biological mechanism, but androgens are what's responsible for the male body masculinizing. So when, when the male body is exposed to testosterone, it's androgens that actually cause the body to masculinize. And what we mean by masculinize causes the, instead of the, um, instead of the, the labia major becoming, you know, the vagina, it becomes the scrotum and the Adam's apple. That's all the thickness of the vocal cords. All of that gets tied up is, is what we mean by the masculinizing of the body. And then in theory, there are some brain structures that are also different. So the biological explanation simply says that our brains are different. The evolutionary theory, this is kind of an intriguing one. The evolutionary theory says that the patterns we see even in preschoolers, the behavioral difference, the fact that boys play with more physically active toys and girls are playing with more nurturing toys is, 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 an, early, um, is, an, is early modeling of the kind of behaviors, uh, what's called the theory of sexual selection. And the theory says that men are programmed or biologically programmed to aggression because evolutionarily their goal is to maximize their reproduction and they want to spread their fertility, they want to spread their seed to as many, many females as possible. And one of the ways they do that is by being more aggressive and more dominant. So you see dominance and aggression in little boys because evolutionarily they're going to need those skills when they become adult when they become reproductive adults right so we and, and women then are the other so because women's role in reproduction is nurturing and caregiving and and women will will be uh they'll be way more picky about who they who they pair bond with they'll be way more picky about who they mate with because their physical investment in offspring is, you know, like one pregnancy could end her life and she can only have one baby at a time and he can have hundreds of babies at a time, right, each year. So the behaviors that we start to see in children when they're young is, pre, is sort of preemptive, right, or are preparing them for the nurturing role that's going to come with motherhood uh, or the aggressive role that's going to come with masculine male domination. Mm -hmm. A lot of sex talk here, isn't it? Then you've got the psychoanalytical perspective, and this is Freud, remember? And what Freud, Freud, oh, this, this one is a little hard for me. Many of you commented in the discussion that this one was kind of abstract. I am right there with you. But in this psychoanalytical, so he says that gender identification is a, is a process when a child, and again, it kind of goes back to sex and penises, when a child recognize or identifies themselves that they will learn to identify oh i'm a boy daddy's a boy i need to act like daddy right that they'll take on and uh, yeah pretty much and that girls girls don't have penises so then they fear that girls will castrate them um and so that yeah that it's this that it's this sex that, that they mimic that kind of like they mimic the behavior that they've seen in their father because of their their understanding of their sexual similarity with their father yeah cognitive theory Whew, this is one I, okay I, I, this one is one that i can explain a little better cognitive theory remember cognitive is about thinking and specifically you know that's social cognitive theory cognitive theory says is that <clears throat> We learn, just kind of get my head in the right space, that boys and this is how boys should act and girls should act. It's a matter of learning and it's a matter of thinking. That as more time goes on, we begin, no, oh, that's social cognitive theory, right? So it's sooner than, okay. So, so going back to an earlier chapter when we were talking about schemas and 
that we have these ideas, right? The schemas are like collections of ideas that summarize our understanding. The children develop the ability to sort out and they, they begin, they, un, they, they learn uh, that they're a boy and that they're a girl. And then they learn that boys through observation, I think this is how it is, through observation, the boys play with trucks. Isn't that how it works? Uh, yeah, that girls, girls wear skirts and boys wear pants. And eventually, and that boys play with trucks and girls play with cars. I mean, I'm sorry, boys play with trucks. <laughs> Actually, that kind of is true. Boys play with trucks and girls play with dolls. And I am a boy, so therefore, I wear pants and I play with cars. Right. And that's what's referred to as their schema. So basically, it's the idea that they that they create in their mind through uh, through processing different bits of information. Right. They create in their mind this what sociologists would call an ideal type, this ideal of what a boy is. And a boy wears blue and they wear jeans and they play with trucks and they play outside. Girls wear pink. They play skirts. They play in the kitchen. I know that I'm a boy, so I have to do, or I do, wear pants, wear blue, and play with trucks. That if I do the girl things, and so this idea of gender identity, and there's some researchers that suggest that like up until like the age of five or six, children don't even, they haven't, con they haven't conceptualized, they don't understand that their sex won't change. And so what gender identity, what this theory suggests is that if this is what boys do and this is what girls do, if I do what a girl does, I may become a girl because they haven't understand that they haven't grasped that sex doesn't change, which is really interesting because there is something called gender fluid, which suggests that your gender does change. And then I think about my little daughter, right? When she was in preschool, some days she'd go to school very feminine, and other days she would wear her Spider Man shirt, you know? And as I think about this, I think, was she like, shifting genders like did she think that if she wore her spider-man shirt that she could be that she also then could play with trucks when she wore the spider-man shirt i wish i'd have thought about that at the time and the third theory which takes cognitive and it adds sort of a layer of social um of social social learning in there which is called social learning theory or social cognitive theory social learning theory says that we learn by observation, right? And we learn through rewards and punishments. The classic example that, I, that I've used for years is the idea that, um, you know, Johnny comes home from, Johnny uh, was playing outside, or Johnny's daddy comes home and he sees Johnny throwing the football back and forth and his dad says, yeah, man, that's my boy. And he gets out there and he throws the football too. Well, the next day, Johnny's dad comes home and, and Johnny's up in his mom's room, you know, playing with makeup and, you know, putting his lipstick on and his dad goes berserk and his dad's like, what are you doing? And throws a fit. What does Johnny learn? Johnny learns he better not put on makeup. So he learns that social learning, you learn through interaction with other people. Social cognitive theory says, so basically rewards and punishments. Social cognitive theory says that, yes, I learn by watching and I learn by rewards, but I'm also thinking about it, right? I'm putting, it says we learn gender by observation. And so I'm, I'm thinking about, let's see, uh, that's a girl, she's doing that, that's a boy, he's doing that. And so I am, I don't, it's not explicitly rewards and punishments, but it can be more sort of observational and um, yeah, it can be more sort of observational and thought based instead of just being just rewards and punishments, which I must say, I kind of thought my daughter would figure that out simply by watching TV that girls also cooked, but apparently she didn't. I'm going to stop here and we will come back. Oh, and we'll talk about, oh, play and parenting.